<clears throat> okay, as I said, today is the birthday of uh, Thomas Heatherwick, and we wish him happy birthday. I will make a presentation, a rather comprehensive presentation on his works. But because today I received this uh, material about uh, Bjarke Ingels, with whom he works for the headquarters of Google, I thought of starting with this short video, and then I will talk about Heatherwick, and at the end, I will talk about the Arke Ingels and Big. And perhaps we can talk about a, a certain comparison between Heatherwick and Ingels, or if you want, between Ingels and Heatherwick. But I am playing now the, the video. I hope it works because. all over the universe from the construction of galaxies to the threat of human DNA. But it's the spiral's immaculate geometry and the suggestion of infinite that has mesmerized us in all cultures across time and space. In 1916, in New York, another force, the voice of the people, was being applied to the growing city. Their demand for daylight at street level was requiring the buildings to step back as they reached towards the sky. And so, the New York skyscraper was born. On Manhattan's west side, we bring together the spiral form and the New York skyscraper to create the spiral, a new tower that stands out amongst its neighbors, yet feels completely at home. The spiral will punctuate the northern end of the High Line. The linear path will appear to carry through into the spiral of the tower, forming an ascending ribbon of lively green spaces extending the high line into the skyline. A building designed for the people that occupy it, the spiral ensures that every floor of the tower opens up to the outdoors, creating hanging gardens and cascading atria that connect the open floor plates from the ground floor to the summit into a single uninterrupted workspace. And of course, these majestic views of the surrounding city. Well, uh, I apologize for the quality of the of the of the video. <clears throat> Maybe it has to do with my uh, poor technology, an old laptop, and I know when I use uh, YouTube or uh, this one uh, uh, and Zoom at the same time, the quality is not great. But uh, unfortunately, if you watch it yourself and it was published, I think either on the Zine or uh, Arch Daily today. Uh, the Spiral by uh, Big and uh, uh, B.R.K. Ingels, in better uh, technical uh, conditions, you'll understand perhaps why I got so agitated by this, because the triumphalism, I don't know if you noticed at the end, uh, his posture where with his legs apart and looking, it's something frightening in this uh, glorification of the human at a time when actually the human is destroying the earth. And it's not that I have apocalyptic uh, visions. The truth is we have the pandemic, we have the climate change, we have problems with sustainability, we have problems with the billions of people uh, or maybe hundreds of millions of people who have nothing to eat, who have no water. And here is this man with his legs apart, you know, looking like some kind of a Prometheus, like a god you know, who wants to reform the earth in the name of a very questionable triumphalism. I'm very much against this because I think true greatness is, is, is something, uh, is that a difficult marriage between being an eagle and a snake, be to being, between being the proudest animal, as it was called the eagle, and the most discerning one. In other words, between uh, um, the not arrogance, but uh, audacity and modesty. And this modesty, I do not see in this man at all. And um, anyway, we'll talk about uh, him when, when he, his, his time will come. And I begin now with, with, with Thomas Heatherwick, with, uh, yes, with Thomas Heatherwick, because it is his birthday. And Thomas Heatherwick is himself not exempt from uh, uh, 
uh, I think uh, questionable kind of ambition. I think ambition is, is, uh, is positive when it's not uh, directed towards, uh, um, when it's not related to, to egocentrism. And uh, I, I feel that both him and, uh, and uh, Bjarke Ingels are uh, um, uh, almost anachronistic, uh, anachronistic examples of egocentrism. So I begin with him. Uh, Thomas Heatherwick, as you know, he was, uh, um, he's a designer. He, he didn't study architecture, but he, he builds uh, a lot. And uh, I would say uh, often in an interesting way. And he does have talent. And I think he has uh, uh, application and seriousness. But there is a but. And I will, uh, I will mention that but B-A-T-B-U-T when I arrive there. Uh, unfortunately, again, a little technical problem, but here is the man. Uh, he looks interesting. He looks sensitive. Uh, he looks a little bit, uh, you know, bohemian, but uh, we'll see what is, uh, I have almost felt like saying, hiding behind the bohemian. Uh, and he, this, this picture of him I do not like. Uh, because it's so ambitiously, uh, it's a mystification, you know, it's, 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 I mean, look, look at his posture, he's posing, he's, he, this is not genuine uh, intensity, this is mimicked uh, intensity, and uh, it's, it's something disturbing about this, uh, um, I, I call it mystification, and I hope I'm not just envious or jealous, but, uh, it's something about him that I do not like. And if he was here, I would tell him the same thing. He is mimicking. He is not as intense and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, terrible or enfant terrible as, as he, he likes to portray himself. But, but we live in this age. Still, we live, although we, we are confronted with many uh, crises and we should be more humble, no, the, we are at the apotheosis of, uh, uh, of uh, should we say, Homo Faber, Homo Fab uh, Sapiens, Homo, uh, I don't know what, but uh, I think at the same time, we should acknowledge that, uh, that uh, 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 anthropocentrism is going through a big crisis. And uh, those who think that the, the age of man is at its end, do, do know something, you know, because we kill the animals, we kill the plants. Yes, he's trying to bring back because, because this is what we do now. We are very good at climbing our buildings with greenery, you know, with trees, with bushes, uh, to mimic, again, to mimic concern for nature. It's just mimicking. That's all there is because we don't give up on our arrogance on this earth. And this is a big problem. And both him and Ingels are very, very uh, vicious in this respect because they give the illusion. I mean, you saw Ingels, he talks about the spiral. Beautiful. I have myself a presentation called the spiral in architecture. He's right. The spiral exists in cosmos, exists even perhaps even within ourselves, exists in, uh, in the, the, uh, the forces uh, that, that generate life. It is true. But when you use these, these, uh, these uh, forces to, uh, uh, to serve uh, uh, an outdated uh, mode of uh, human centrality, I think is wrong. And so, um, again, I accuse both of a certain lack of modesty, because if you can combine audacity with modesty, then you truly achieve greatness. But if you uh, just change the proportion a little bit and you have, let's say, 51% at best audacity and 49% modesty, then you are a little bit less than you should have been or you could have been. Anyway, great pavilion, uh, uh, in a great Britain pavilion in Shanghai. This was a great building. I truly like this building by, by um, uh, Thomas Heatherwick. Uh, the seed cathedral. I even like the, the naming because I think we need something like this, the return of the cathedral to nature and uh, to the germinative uh, element of nature, the seed. So I don't know who had the idea, if it was his or not, whatever. I think it was a brilliant work. 
uh, very, very surprising uh, in, 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 in all matters relating to its um, um, accomplishment, you know, uh, design, landscape design, interior design, uh, whatever. It, 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 it was a very, uh, uh, very, very interesting participation from Great Britain. And for this, I salute Thomas Heatherwick. And if he was here, I would congratulate him with an open heart. This, this first work or one of his early works um, uh, shows indeed uh, great promise. But, but something happened uh, not much later and you'll see. Maybe it is true that, uh, you know, uh, success corrupts. It's possible. Many people succumb to it, even myself at one moment. And at one point in my life, although I was far from having uh, this kind of success, success, but I had a little bit and I got carried away by it and I fell and I deserved falling. I deserved falling because uh, uh, I myself made the mistake to, to, to not balance myself. And uh, I can only imagine in their case, like Ingelsen and Heatherwick, they have some of the greatest commissions on earth and uh, you know it's very easy to to yes to to lose your 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 modesty in this. Otherwise, he looks like a nice so-called guy. I don't like to use the word guy because I don't know if you know where this very common expression in in the United States, at least, but all over the world comes from guy. It comes comes from a certain gentleman called Guy Folks or Guy Folks was actually hanged. He was, um, um, I don't know, a, 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 a provocative. Uh, I don't know too many details about him, but I know he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a man that was at, um, at war with society, with authority, with, uh, with everybody. And, uh, and uh, yeah, he was hanged. So now these days we all became guys, you know, hi guys. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe I'm again old fashioned, maybe, <clears throat> maybe uh, I stick to all the forms of interaction, but it's something I think I still think a little bit uh, perverse and vicious about uh, using this word, hi guy. I mean, <clears throat> everything became leveled, you know, uh, you say hi guy to Michelangelo and you say hi guy to, I don't know, a certain uh, person on the sidewalk which in a way, yes, they are equal in a way, but why should we identify ourselves with this uh, uh, infamous character in uh, British uh, politics and uh, social life and history? Anyway, enough with the guys. I do like this construction. I don't know if I can call it, yes, I, I call it architecture. I think the idea is brilliant to bring the seeds of the world inside this uh, um, you know, building and uh, it's, it's like a bank of seeds and, uh, and uh, you know, to, to even talk about the, the seeds cathedral. Uh, I, I like this very much. I like the idea and I also like the project. Uh, and it's done in a very imaginative way. Uh, of course, it's not, you know, the typical building, but I like its fragility and also you know, there are insinuations, maybe they were done intentionally. You see the uh, suggested discrete uh, kind of cross. Um, I don't know about it, but uh, it's, it's discrete enough and, uh, you know, it doesn't bother perhaps anyone. So this was, in my opinion, it was a brilliant work by, uh, by Thomas Heatherwick, uh, uh, where he was able to cross the frontier or the threshold between uh, architecture and design, or between design and architecture. Um, I think we need more such cathedrals in the world. You know, uh, why not, for example, design, and not necessarily a cathedral, but we can design, for example, or think of building uh, uh, a, a building dedicated to friendship or to love or to the wind or to the grass. I myself designed, well, not really designed. I made a sketch for a so-called uh, the grass cathedral, La Catedral de l'Herbe, um, the cathedral of grass, because there are so many things to be celebrated in the world 
this very world that uh, we are on the verge of living. And today I received an article about Bill Gates, who called himself not being uh, um, a man of, of one of the men of Mars or something like this, referring to the fact that as opposed to Elon Musk and uh, you know the, the owner, founder of eBay and Amazon, he doesn't want to go to Mars. He doesn't want to go to the moon. He wants to handle the vaccine, uh, you know, the health of the population here on Earth and so on. And although I'm not a fan of Bill Gates, in this I, I am together with him. I don't understand why, why should we leave the Earth, which is really still a very privileged place to be on in comparison with, uh, with Mars and, uh, and, and the moon. Anyway, uh, coming back. There is something, I mean, there is a suggestion in this building that I think is very worthy of, of, of uh, contemplating and, 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 and um, uh, moving forward from it. This idea to, to, to return to, in a way, to, to, to a, in a certain way, to a, um, not sacred, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like the word sacred, but, but then what words could I use? Is it a cathedral per se? It's not. But it goes beyond the religion. It, 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 is, uh, it, it is a building that starts from, you know, in this case, from the seed. And I, I think we need something like this to start from the very bottom, from the very basics, from the grassroots. And, and I see something like this in, in this, uh, I would say, exceptional structure, uh, exceptional construction. I mean, even the way it looks, you know, it doesn't look like a, like a building. It looks like a, I don't know how could you de how could you describe it? But it's it's very ingenious, and uh, I think very very interesting. So, in my my opinion, and I am subjective, but uh, I defend my subject subjectivity. I congratulate him for this building. Uh, not that he needs my congratulations, but I, I express it, or I express them. Uh, and it's not just the, you know, the main building, so to speak, but the whole landscape, the platform on which it sits, it's well done. Uh, and uh, it, because it has this marriage between uh, l'esprit de geometry and l'esprit de finesse, between vulnerability and strength, and I like this. Um, of course, it's a showpiece. It's a piece for, uh, an, um, you know, um, expo now for an international expo but it is intriguing it is provocative you are curious no what what is this apparition you can't even call it a building so uh, my head off uh, from my head in front of this and look at the plan also uh, i think brilliant because it's uh, within the rectangle he provokes surprises he uh, accommodates even, uh, you know, functional uh, prosaic spaces and so on. So everything works in a, as a whole, as a surprising whole. So I, I think he did a very good job here. Now the rolling bridge in London, this is also an interesting work, an early work. Uh, this is the bridge, if you can believe it, but it's, it's a bridge that is not yet a bridge, but it could become a bridge and you'll see why. You see, it's a mechanism, it's an invention, it's an ingenious invention, and it works. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most, um, uh, you know, uh, inexpensive uh, uh, bridge, but it also makes sense in terms of functionality, you know, because when you want to uh, allow, you know, certain, uh, I don't know, a uh, boat or something to, uh, to move across, what do you do? But in this case, this is what you do. You, you, lift the, you lift the bridge. Of course, the other solution would have been, but because it's so narrow, you really could not have created a sufficiently tall or high arch in order to, to go, to, you know, traditionally, so to speak, uh, with a whatever boat underneath. So, it's both, and it's also whimsical. It is functional, as you can see, it is whimsical. It is efficient. It is probably not the least expensive uh, bridge, but it's a bridge that becomes something else. 
it's a mechanism. And uh, again, I think he, he, he did something very interesting here. I don't think there is another bridge like this in the whole world. And it, it, it functions perfectly and it is in London and not in, I don't know where. So, you know, his responsibilities were high when he, he designed it. When it is flat, it looks normal now. It looks, it looks fine. It's nothing, uh, you know, uh, and there is still space underneath for the, uh, the inhabitants of the water to, to go on the other side, so it's fine. And when it, when it is like this, it becomes uh, increasingly, uh, you know, uh, provocative and uh, it becomes a sculpture, you know? So the bridge becomes a sculpture, which is fine. And it's also a dynamic object. It's not static, it's dynamic. So again, I think Heather, Heather Wick did a, a very interesting work here. And now I don't know if these people are staring at uh, this work in particular or waiting for something else. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but it is an unusual, uh, very unusual uh, uh, bridge. So his skill as a designer was, uh, uh, was proved. Uh, his skill as, a, as an architect was proved in the previous construction, and now we'll see other works where this, uh, the conjunction of these two skills is displayed, uh, um, um, you know, I would say with, with uh, intensity. But as I anticipated, I also have uh, a certain uh, hesitation about him, and I, I, will, I, will, I will say why. And then we'll compare him with Ingels with Bjarke Ingels. I don't know if they are friends, but they are partners in building the Google uh, headquarters. Uh, so this is the bridge in London by Heatherwick. And now the East Beach Cafe, um, also in Great Britain. Now here, I don't know very well what to say. Is this, uh, is this curtain perhaps? Uh, it's, it's, it's like, a, um, 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 you know, some kind of a strange animal on the beach. Uh, <clears throat> again, I would say uh, it is very showy, you know, and uh, it's very heavy, as you can see, and probably very expensive. Now, of course, if people had the money to create such a cafe, why not? Although, I don't know. You know, a cafe uh, being a place where you just pick up a coffee and you go out on the beach. I mean, uh, you know, here is the sea. Uh, I don't know. I would not have done a cafe so monumental, but nobody asked me to express my, my preferences, so I better shut up. But, um, you know, looking at this uh, strange thing here, when you think about what a coffee is and uh, you look at the building, uh, is there not some kind of a discrepancy? Plus the, 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 the violence of the eruptive uh, uh, opacity, the, 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 the aggressiveness of its turning its back towards what is not the sea to me is also alarming. It, 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 in fact, it, it reminds me a little bit respecting the proportions of the stone wall that the founder of Facebook, the promoter of, 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 of communication and democracy and dialogue and so on, the stone wall he built around his proper, proper, proper property, I think in, in, in Hawaii. I have seen images with in total contradiction with what Facebook is supposed to mean. So here, is this about communication? I mean, sorry, Mr. Heatherwick, but you are blocking the view, are you not? And you are blocking the view towards the sea, Mr. Heatherwick, not um, towards some desolate, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, place at the periphery. To, uh, you are blocking the view of the sea. And so here I'm not, I'm not really together with him, but that's okay too. He can, he can handle that quite well. Uh, now here, but even here, I don't know, uh, if you take away all this uh, uh, heavy and expensive uh, showmanship, you get actually a banal building because what is here is banal. Uh, so this is just a mask. 
a mask which violently excludes what is on this side from a dialogue with what is on this side, which is the sea. At the interior, what can we say? We have seen things like this, you know, uh, mimicking being a cave. Although the tables and the chairs have nothing to do with a cave, but uh, it's okay. It's a stage design. I don't think this is one of his greatest achievements. Now, the visitor facility at the Bombay Sapphire Distillery in, in England. Now, here there are some interesting things. I, I like the fact that, <clears throat> that Thomas Heatherwick is uh, flirting with uh, the Baroque, with a Baroque uh, sensibility. And he does it, I think, convincingly, and not only, you know, visually convincingly, but also in terms of, of, of meaning, because it's a distillery. It has to do with alcohol. It, it has to do with intoxication. So what do we see here? <laughs> the vapors of the alcohol, in a way, you know, uh, making you dizzy or uh, making you intoxicated. It has to do with intoxication. So uh, I don't know if he did it intentionally, but... Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the inflaming oneself through drinking uh, is suggested in a way through this building. Let's say before drinking, we are like this building. And after we drink, we become like this, you know, uh, exuberant beyond uh, all limits and uh, even disruptively so. Anyway, it is interesting, and he did it. It was built. I think this work is 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 is, uh, is better than the previous one, in my opinion. And there is the vortex, there is the spiral, the left spiral, uh, you know, not uh, a literal spiral, but uh, suggestions of the of the spiral movement. Now the guys talking about the guy, Guy's, Guy's Hospital, Cardiology, Outpatients Building in London. These are early works. This is also interesting. Now, you know, when you look at this, you know, you, you know, imagine you have uh, some heart problems. You imagine you have palpitations, no, uh, or the tachycardia or some irregularities. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's something a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit ominous in terms of form here. Because, uh, I mean, I had problems with my heart myself. And uh, probably when you have a crisis with a heart, uh, a cardiac problem, you don't really care about the elevation of the building. But I, I wonder what he really, really wanted to say with this. You know, uh, yes, there is a rhythmicity, and maybe this rhythm could evoke, a, you know, a regular rhythm for the heart. But then, what is here? Um, anyway, I, I don't want to be didactic. I, it, it's okay, I think. But I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I have seen works that are less, uh, less dramatic and maybe more adequate for, uh, you know, an emergency room or something having to do with, uh, you know, uh, essentially. Health is about that, not about uh, uh, flamboyance, uh, you know. But it's okay; we we, we can take it. Um, I'm not against at all, uh, you know, baroque sensitivities. Uh, but anyway, the hanging garden in, gardens in Shanghai. Now, I prepared this presentation a while ago. In the meantime, this work uh, uh, arrived at completion. You'll only see some images that uh, before completion, but they will, and plus you probably know the work because it was highly publicized. The hanging gardens, not at Babylon, but in Shanghai. Now here I have a problem. I have to uh, abuse maybe my, uh, my uh, privilege of uh, having the microphone, so to speak. Um, I, I don't know what a bush feels or a little tree, or grass, or plants, or flowers. I don't, I don't. I, I, I am unable to have a dialogue with what I mentioned, although I would gladly do, uh, because I think they have a wisdom that I do not have, and humans in general do not have. But talking about this, I think the way he uh, creates these uh, pillars uh, this uh, artificial, I mean, made of concrete in order to hold um, the plant, uh, to me, is a little bit problematic. 
I like this mountainous, you know, kind of urbanism, if I can call it so. I like the fact that he, it's also fashionable. I just learned that MVR TV proposed something uh, in Hyde Park in London, a mountain, because we erased, we flattened the real mountains, and now we create artificial mountains, of course. You know, but we build these uh, horrid cities, and then we miss nature. And then comes Mr. Heatherwick and creates uh, something in between a mountain and a pyramid. And it's interesting from afar. But when you look uh, in, uh, in detail, um, this bothered me. And you'll see that he repeats them also in New York. Uh, and you'll see that project. These are massive concrete uh, structures that are supposed to uh, hold to, to, yes, to sustain uh, fragile natural matter, you know, uh, uh, green matter. And so we removed, we removed the bush and the tree and the grass and the plants and the, and the flowers from their earth. Then we build these expensive things, these uh, you know sculptural, monumental things made of concrete, and then we 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 uh, isolate these uh, the, the, these these pieces of green on these pedestals, you know. And I don't know to place a a, a bush or a, a little tree or anything that is natural on a concrete pedestal. To me is. Um, is uh, perverse and demagogical. I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't do it. I mean, it's do we need this kind of demagogy? I, I mean, yes, I like the mountain. Yes, I like even the pyramids. Yes, I like the fragmentation. But I don't like what he does with these uh, concrete things. I mean, unfortunately, I should have added other pictures and I didn't and I planned to and then I, I got carried away by but you see them and you you probably know the project I mean this to me they are very theatrical and they and what do they hold I mean if we were able to talk with this plant here or with this one maybe they will tell us you know why why are the humans so uh, so arrogant why don't they leave us in peace why do they uh, place us in this way but we don't ask them and they cannot tell us but i actually think it's an abuse it's an abuse and paradoxically this abuse is done by someone who claims he loves nature like uh, you know uh, uh, one of the partners at mv uh, rtv said uh, you know talked about uh, um, uh, uh, outsmarting nature and they are building a, a, a fake uh, mountain kind or hill in London you know uh, so 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 much about uh, uh, outsmarting nature anyway um, yes it is interesting but in my opinion it is uh, at least a little bit demagogical and uh, I, I don't trust it it's it's something about it and, and, and uh, I, I, you will see at, at the end of this presentation another work very similar with this, the same attitude in New York this time. And uh, um, those people who claim that this work is not very ecological, I'm talking about uh, the one in London, uh, in uh, New York, I think uh, they, they had a point. Anyway, we go now to this very interesting actually work, uh, the creative units, these are for artists you know, some kind of studios for artists. We see the same tension between them and nature. Uh, the, the unit, the so-called unit is artificial, is, uh, is, um, it creates this, uh, this community of artificialities and it is interesting and inciting. What is less interesting is the interior and we look at it. But the exterior I think is very interesting because of this, uh, you know, wrinkled um, the foil, uh, and uh, yeah, it's not organic, but because of these wrinkles, it creates a, a skin that doesn't leave you indifferent at all. Otherwise, as you can see, the scheme is very simple, not to say simplistic. There are little boxes covered with that wrinkled material. Uh, and uh, 
As for the drawing itself, I don't know if he, he did the drawing or someone else in his office, but the drawing seems to mimic a little bit innocence, but uh, I'm not sure it, it is, it, it's, it, in my opinion, I mean, I'm talking about the drawing, it's just the drawing. I'm trying to understand the man behind the drawing, if indeed he did this. And it's possible he did because it's a preliminary sketch. But to me, it's a little bit infantile, you know, uh, but we live in an infantilized culture that's without question, thanks to Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney and all kinds of aberrations coming from uh, Hollywood and spread all over the world. So in this infantilized culture, uh, you know, someone who draws like this would be very welcome. Even B.R.K. Ingers, he did, doesn't draw very differently. His drawings, you know, uh, are, are uh, asymptotes, uh, if not more than asymptotes towards um, cartoons, actually. I mean, who draws today like, uh, even like Al Alvar Alto, not to mention Michelangelo, since tomorrow it will be, will pay homage to him since there are, I don't know, 400, uh, I don't know, 57 years or something since his death. Anyway. But the, but, the, but the unit is interesting. Although if you remove this uh, interesting coating, you realize it's not so complex, you know. It's, it's a box with a um, light and uh, this rift of light and with the entrance. And, uh, but if, we, if I look at this unit, what do I see? I see a structure, a building, that is not comfortable with uh, attempting to have a dialogue with nature. Now we know from the history of art and from the history of architecture and from the history of culture in general, that very important creators underline the dialogue with nature. Here we are told that man is actually some kind of a nuisance within nature and that a true dialogue cannot truly really happen. He might be right to an extent, but it's not that ideal that we should aspire towards, I think, if, if we still believe in ideals. Uh, this was a sketch by him. Um, and uh, yeah. Now, why did he need his, uh, you know, you see what's written here, true, crinky, crinkly, thin, uh, shed, uh, crinkly. Thin. I don't know what this means, but from the from from the sound it might make it when you try to pronounce it, I get the feeling. You know, it's. I mean, what about an architecture that is uh, crinkly? Is it crinkly, crinkly thin architecture? I don't know. To me, it doesn't sound too 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 good. But uh, maybe I have uh, so-called classicist uh, preconceptions. It's very possible. Although I love the avant-garde, but um, it, it's something about this, I don't know. And it is him here. This is Thomas Heatherwick. It's his spirit, his psychology is here. And I'm not saying it's not interesting. It's just, you'll see that inside the space is very conventional. Uh, so the, towards the outside, it appears to be, um, you know, alarmingly different. But inside, I hope I have some images here of the inside. Um, also, this metallic uh, uh, shield uh, certainly doesn't uh, encourage one to think that we can communicate with the trees, with the vegetation, with the sky, and so on. And this is a, I hope, uh, sorry for the resolution, but you can uh, uh, not to speak about, this reminds me of the Richards Laboratories by uh, Louis Kahn, where the scientists had to cover with foil, uh, the windows, because it was too much sunlight and so on. Here I see the artist blocking the light because uh, obviously the, the architect didn't think too much about, about that. But uh, here it is. Now, if we look at the, at, at, at the building itself and make abstraction of the sculptures, we'll say, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's good, but kind of sterile, no? But fortunately, we have the sculpture, which is adding some agitation, which this is what art is supposed to do, to, do, to, to agitate uh, ourselves and everybody with it and through it. 
but it's still a, an experiment, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, theatrical for my taste, a little bit, uh, I don't know how to, to describe it, but uh, why not in the end? Particularly if you can see that old fashioned bike there, and I love old bicycles, and uh, I know the British uh, love them too. Now, this work in South Africa, I think, is interesting and good. Uh, and because he cut into an existing building and he created these uh, um, visceral interiors, uh, the monumental but also uh, fragile. Uh, uh, made vulnerable in a way because of these cuts that there was, I, I guess this is a silos that uh, that was um, uh, that was uh, subtracted from and, and cut and I think it was an interesting idea and, and look at the interior is uh, it's challenging is uh, um, you know it says something about the unknown about the mystery that art is because this is a, an art museum and so uh, uh, all in all, I think he did a good job here. Uh, and yes, it is concrete, but uh, uh, he was able, this was existing concrete, I imagine, and he just made this hole, these cuts, these this, uh, interventions in the ex existing structure. And uh, the result is, uh, as you see it, uh, <clears throat> I like this image. I used it for one of my invitations. Um, you see, with imagination, with talent, with uh, hard work and so on, you can get interesting results where you also allow uh, change to manifest itself and uh, where you do not try to control everything, but you welcome the unknown because that's what it is here. It's the unknown that uh, challenges us. But the building originally was, uh, you know, kind of like, kind of like this. And uh, so you see, he, he obtained through interventions uh, an interesting interior by, by having the courage to perform uh, unorthodox uh, surgical operations within the, the existing structure. Now, towards the outside, to me, is, a little, is less, less interesting than inside. But in some of the better buildings, this always happens or often happens. It's better to have something more interesting inside than the outside than the other way around in other words if you have a product and the then the content is more interesting than the than what than what contains it than the package i think it's okay but where the package is more important or more challenging or more interesting than the content then uh, we have a problem and unfortunately this happens quite often um, and capitalism is quite good at, uh, at uh, creating uh, very seductive packages, but not always what is inside is at the same level of excellence. But this kind of intervention within a rather orthodox or Cartesian structure is uh, practiced by various architects. Yesterday we saw the uh, the MIT dorm by Stephen Hall, where Mahadev Rahman was an engineer, and there there are these excavated uh, um, interventions within the rather Cartesian structure destined for public activities. So there is a quest for trying to bring the irregular, the cave-like, the visceral within the Cartesian structure. Uh, and uh, it works. It works. He recently built a building that is very similar, actually, to what we see from this level up. I don't have it in this presentation, but you can you can see it on the web. Um, but look at the, again, someone who takes risks is able to build um, important uh, buildings uh, all over the world. If you would have remained at the level of go walking on the on the you know prescribed path, he would not have arrived at such commissions. On the other hand, yes, there are many people who take risks, and not everybody uh, arrives at, uh, at such possibilities. It has to do with many factors, you know, luck. Uh, who knows? It's 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 complicated. Um, 
Now, the university building in, in, in uh, Singapore, uh, this is a, you know, Singapore has a, a, a I, I was told by someone from uh, Indonesia that is the, the Switzerland of Southeast Asia. So they have a lot of money and they invite signature architects to build. And uh, this is how, um, you know, UN Studio built, 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 builds actually continues to build. And here is Thomas Heatherwick. And uh, there are the famous people who, who work in uh, Singapore. Uh, I don't know what to say about this building. It's, again, I think there is a level of demagogy in his work. I'm not against theatricality. I'm not against the theater. I love the theater. And uh, sometimes perhaps when I'm inspired, I can be myself a little bit uh, theatrical, but uh, I don't know. It's something about this uh, that uh, even the plan, you know, it's, it's a little burlesque, I would say, a little bit burlesque. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's. I mean, of course, Singapore can do whatever it wants with its money, uh, but uh, is it a great addition to uh, its, uh, you know, urban fabric? I don't know. Uh, he built another tower uh, in Singapore, and we are going to see it. The city within the gardens of Singapore was thought to be. Uh, a lot of concrete here, you know, uh, and as we learned uh, or relearned from Mahadev Raman yesterday, concrete is a material that produces a lot of pollution. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think in the present, although I love concrete and I love brutalism, and, uh, but, but it is a problem, you know, this material is, uh, is uh, eating up uh, oxygen and producing its opposite and uh, is, is, is not a game. But uh, the architect doesn't seem to care too much because of course we can climb our buildings with uh, uh, forests, with trees or whatever is needed. After we commit the crime, we, uh, we try to make up for it in, uh, in, I would say through some expensive means. Uh, I don't know. I, this building leaves me a little bit cold. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a great fan of this building. In fact, the interior is. The ideas are maybe not bad, but uh, this 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 obsessive curvatures and the, that's why I mentioned the burlesque uh, character. Uh, to me, it, it shows an opulence which is uh, a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Ostentatious and out of place. And I mean, is this the stomach of the building? Uh, not really, but uh, anyway, again, Singapore is absolutely free to do whatever it wants with its uh, riches. Foster and Associates and Heather, Heather Week Studio, they collaborated on this project, uh, the Arts and Culture Center in Shanghai. And I understand these are supposed to move um, I don't know. Again, in, in my opinion, there is a cer certain level of showmanship here that is not, I prefer by far a building by Wang Shu and his wife than by uh, these two uh, big firms in, in the UK. Because yes, yes, there, there might be some interesting things happening here, but all in all is showmanship in my opinion. Sorry for being in a mad, bad mood today. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that this is much better, but somehow in comparison, I, I kind of prefer the modesty of this one. Uh, this uh, kind of facile uh, expressionism uh, and uh, it leaves me cold, but maybe I'm wrong. I am subjective. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. I don't know though what is here in the back. I mean, this was not built, I imagine, but uh, Another, you know, so-called amazing structure built by, uh, I don't know whom. Now the New York's Hudson Yards, this was, uh, this was built, the vessel, and I, I like in, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know about the staircase to nowhere. It's almost like saying a uh, uh, cathedral for nobody. It's, um, I don't know. I know we live at a time of skepticism. 
uh, I know that Samuel Beckett said, I can go on, I will go on, but I don't think he meant going on towards nowhere. This staircase to, to nowhere, to, in my opinion, is a little bit cynical. The very name uh, inside of it is very interesting. This labyrinth, visceral uh, intertwining of stairs, I like it. Uh, I imagine uh, uh, being there is, is challenging, of course, if your legs can take it. Uh, but from the outside, I, I don't like it at all because it's, it's almost like a huge, uh, gigantic uh, kind of Christmas uh, thing. You know, this, it, it's symmetrical and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's both uh, hilarious in a way and, and threatening. Uh, inside, yes. But because it's so symmetrical, uh, it's a system. I like it here very much. Here, during the construction, I love it. It's, 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 uh, it's the disorder of life, the construction. It's, it's, it, it's amazing how they, they assembled all these things. And uh, I, I, like the, I like disorder, it's true. But, but, but uh, this disorder is the disorder of life. But when you, when you finalize the object, and this is an object, and maybe that's why, I mean, he was and he is, he still is a designer, and there is a slight difference between a designer and an architect. Of course, an architect can do design, and of course, designers can do architecture. But somehow, it is different between designing a building and designing an object. An object, although there are many architects and including some of the most famous who talk about the building as being an object. I've heard uh, Rem Kolhas a few times, the architectural object, the object, the object. But in my opinion, a building is not an object because there is also the atmosphere. You enter into it, it's, uh, your interaction is part of a city, a town, a village. Uh, it's not an object. Uh, would you call a villa by uh, Palladio an object? Or uh, even opera in Sydney, or even a, a small uh, hut, you know, or a vernacular building. It's, it's, it's more than an object. Because it's not just objectivity there, and it's not your relationship with it is not between, a, I, I don't know how to say it, a building is more complex in a way you build yourself while you build a building. So it's, it's outside of you, but it's also containing you and you are in, 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 a, in an organic complex relationship with a building. It's different with a vase. No, you take a vase, you take it from here, you put it there. It's an object, but a building, I, in my opinion, again, maybe I have uh, old fashioned ideas, uh, is not an object and it shouldn't be an object. And in fact, the greatest architects that I know never use this word to talk about an, uh, an, a building. I never saw this word being used by Wright or Le Corbusier or Miss or Kahn, never. But the stars of today even, they use it very often. Maybe not all of them, but some of them they do because so-called we live in, uh, you know, uh, objectified, uh, um, we live an objectified existence, we, we are still followers of the Enlightenment, we are rational, we are cerebral, we believe in our mythos being science, and our buildings are objects. What I like about this picture, and uh, even this one, although here we see a crystallization that is, uh, you know, symmetrical, but um, it, it is mysterious, and uh, I, I don't quite know what I'm looking at, so it intrigues me. I like it. Uh, I like it during the construction, but I don't like the fact that it is somehow, it, it, it doesn't have a balance between centripetality and centrifugality. Uh, it, it's, it, it is an object. I mean, look, if you look at it, it's like a vase. Well, a building shouldn't be like a vase. It happens that in reality it's huge, but it's still, the the conception of it is of an object. And uh, yeah, um, I'm not mentioning the fact that uh, now there are voices that are critical of it because uh, apparently there are people who either fall or throw themselves from uh, those stairs and they, to their death. Uh, this has to do with, uh, you know, um, 
depression with you know this could happen also from a balcony you don't need to the vessel in fact it is even called a vessel i just uh, thought of it I, yeah uh, my my uh, my uh, reticence vis-a-vis -vis this building which i like very much during construction like here for example it's 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 miraculous no it's it has vigor it has power it is intriguing uh, it has movement it, it is dynamical but uh, um, uh, when it is finalized you realize it's just a vase a, a vessel and uh, of course the word vessel i mean look here when it is not finalized it's primal it's archaic it's atavistic it's uh, you name it i love it like this i love it it's like a you know a carcass the carcass of some strange uh, uh, construction but when it is uh, now of course new york city welcome to new york city and i miss new york city this spirit of of, of you know experimentation and the dancing on the streets and uh, there, there is something very nice about this city but unfortunately you see here um, you know the 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 rendering of, of the vessel and you realize that in its symmetry it is a little bit I think um, um, in my opinion it doesn't uh, encourage towards freedom but uh, rather towards uh, mimicked freedom anyway the the Google headquarters by him and big or uh, Bjarke Ingels here you see the two heroes and I'm going to talk about both today in terms of, you know, uh, subjective taste. I mean, of course, I'm a man. I'm not supposed to truly express, uh, you know, my likings vis-a-vis uh, -vis men. But uh, between the two men, I kind of like the one on the right because he looks a little bit more troubled. Although it might be that Ingels is even more troubled than him. Anyway, they are an interesting pair. Maybe one will write one day a book called uh, Ingels and the Heatherwick. Um, so they designed this uh, thing uh, very, I don't know exactly what is happening with this building. They began the construction, but they, for some reason, the, 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 the final uh, work is not coming into being. And I, I don't know where, very well why, maybe because of the pandemic, uh, in essence, is about a village-like, uh, um, you know, uh, building, let's call it so, or a, a assemblage of small structures, a community of little, little buildings covered by, uh, by a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, roof. That's what they build. And uh, you can see... <clears throat> Maybe I have a, a, on this presentation a little bit later other images with it. Now the Eden Singapore, Singapore apartments. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, I don't know. Should we comment about the Eden? We know what Eden is, right? Um, we 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 got banished from Eden, and now we are building it in Singapore with the help of uh, Thomas Heatherwick. So Eden is designed to resemble a spine blade simple vertical uh, sorry i have to do something about this uh, 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 mobile phone I, I don't like mobile phones at all uh, is designed to resemble a spine blade simple vertical rectilinear planes with slim windows form the blade with generous garden balconies situated in between <clears throat> this approach grants privacy for each of the 20 apartments you'll see it's a huge building but it has only 20 apartments probably one apartment per floor, and allows for a generous central living space that forms the heart of each residence. The unconventional concrete walls are molded with a topographical map of Singapore's terrain, which has been abstracted to create a unique three-dimensional texture. The focus on creating a garden for each apartment is a response to the disconnection between high-rise apartments and the lush greenery at street level in Singapore, responding to Lee Kuan Yew's original vision of Singapore as a city in a garden, the design extends the landscape of Singapore upwards through the building of, with a series of hanging gardens, connecting the interior living space with the outdoors, providing views of Singapore's green landscape. And this is the building, of course, on the left. Uh, 
What can we say? Uh, I mean, you know, a society of privileges, uh, Singapore, I mean, can you imagine having an apartment, uh, a whole floor for just one apartment? Um, uh, you know, uh, this is not for everybody. I mean, these people, these poor people certainly feel poor in comparison with what's going on here. Yes, there are many trees here, but I don't see really a lot of lush garden in the back. Um, Yes, here is uh, Lux Calme Volupte, the beauty of living. Look at the look at the, the exotic trees. You know, it's uh, it's indeed not for everybody. Uh, so nature was made just for some people, not for everybody. Uh, in another presentation I made, I saw some people also in Singapore, in the proximity, in the shadow of a building by UN Studio, quite an elaborate structure and. On the grass in the park under a tree, there were a few migrant or immigrants, uh, migrant people, uh, you know, with their belongings, a luggage or whatever, sleeping there on under the tree because they couldn't afford, of course, to build here, to 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 live here. We'll, you will see some. Look at these balconies, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I have a, a nostalgia for the existence minimum of the, the early um, the social housings uh, by uh, some German uh, architects at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, uh, here is something else, and it does bother me that the people of talent, and obviously Hedrick has talent, uh, work for an elite uh, that affords to build very extravagant structures without really thinking about, uh, you know, the discrepancy between what they build and uh, what is uh, what is around them. Uh, look at the, uh, I mean, look at the apartment, you know, look at this room, if we can still call it a room. Look at the balcony, if we can still call it a balcony, you know, I mean, you know, it's like in the 1000 uh, Miami building by Zaha Hadid, where on the balcony you can have parties for 100 people on one balcony, you know, if we can still call it a balcony. It does bother me that the architects of talent of today uh, almost exclusively work for those who are very rich, as if the whole world is like this, you know. I, I wonder what the architect feels because he knows that not everybody is like this, even in Singapore. So, it, it, you know, the, the, the le yes, aesthetics uh, sometimes have difficulties to take into consideration ethics, but I think a good architect uh, is, uh, is, um, has empathy, has compassion, uh, has no arrogance, and is trying to, 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 to build in such a way that uh, those less privileged do not feel excluded and, and, and insulted. I mean, this so-called, you know, here I, we have the horizontal nature and here we have the vertical nature. How convenient, you know, Jean Nouvel does it, uh, Boerie does it, uh, Heatherwick does it, everybody does it. Uh, and, and, and why? Because we erase the, the forest, we erase the, we, we flatten the, uh, the, the, the mountains and the hills, and now we climb with a green uh, wherever we can, and, and we can. We can go to the 20th floor, of course. Um, this is without doubt. You see, when you say I am building uh, ecologically, as this building probably claims, but what is ecology? E ecology for me is also ethical. You cannot have a true ecology without also have a certain level of ethics. You, uh, and here, you have the demagogy of, 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 of privilege. And to me, in, in its very essence, it is not ecological. I'm not even saying, mentioning sustainability. There is nothing sustainable here. Uh, and uh, it's just the arrogance of the rich uh, with the help of the, of the talented designer. That's all there is. Uh, I mean, I wonder what the people who live here feel when they descend from, from the ivory tower, the green ivory tower, and walk between more regular people, let's say, you know, what do they feel? Do they have any remorse or guilt or, uh, I don't know, a sense of that maybe they should share or something? 
I mean, look at, anyway, maybe I'm too much of a communist now. And I'm not a communist. I turned my back on communism. I ran away from it. But I don't like capitalism either because, uh, because the, the differences, the discrepancies are not just too big. And both Ingalls and uh, Heatherwick work for, in the case of Ingalls, I saw a building done for, uh, you know, underprivileged uh, people in, in Denmark. And I like it very much because he assumed also, uh, you know, the responsibility to, to, to use his, uh, his uh, expertise, if I can say so, and talent and imagination for those who are not, uh, who are not rich. Very nice. But in this case, uh, it's, it's, I, I still cannot avoid using at least a little bit the word demagogical. And look at the balconies. Why did they need to be like this, you know, inflated and, uh, you know, I mean, look at the human being, you know, how small he is if you compare him to this uh, theatrical, uh, you know. Anyway. Um, is this the elevator, perhaps? And uh, look at the bathroom. Look at the bathroom, you know. <laughs> and this was built very recently. And this is a man who claims that we should return to nature and uh, nature should return to us and we should. But, but look, look, this is an insult. This bathroom is an insult. Look at the, uh, look at the towers with towels, you know, towels, you know, this all white and clean and symmetrical. Look at this huge window. Look at the, look at the space. This, I mean, you could, you could house here a family of three people just in this bathroom. Uh, really, uh, uh, it's, it's, is this marble perhaps? Travertine, it's, it, I mean, just the bathroom is probably costs as much as a, comfortable apartment of several rooms in a more so-called regular building. Yes, it's nice that uh, he abstracted something from the, I didn't understand very well, the map, the landscape of, uh, of Singapore, and it became, it's nice because we need the tactility, we need, uh, we need the world to escape the deadliness of uh, just a white, sleek, uh, flat surface. Now this B, Look at this. I don't know what it means. Maybe I don't know. But this B in itself, uh, this letter B, and I don't know if the architect was responsible for this, but it's so inflated and big and, uh, you know, so fat that uh, um, somehow it expresses something about the building. And yes, the marble behind is like in the Loss House in Vienna by Adolf Loss, very rich. Uh, anyway. A lobby covered in marble is a lobby covered in marble. Not everybody can afford it. Now, this is a text uh, about, uh, uh, I think this is, this is the last work I show, is, uh, is written by a, a graduate from the University of Architecture in Bucharest, Andrea Cutieru, and she writes well. And she wrote, after surpassing many hurdles, the long-awaited public park and performance venue uh, that uh, Heatherwick uh, built is on a set course to completion. The construction of the little island, that's how it is called, is underway. And new images by this photographer um, uh, show the undulating artificial landscape coming together above the Hudson River. And now uh, I have one more text. Designed by Heatherwick Studio, the offshore park will feature three outdoor performance spaces including an 800-seat amphitheater, as well as numerous pathways and viewing platforms, accessed via two dock-like pathways connecting back to the New York City shoreline. The structure comprises some 132 mushrooms-shaped concrete columns that rise above the water, creating a new topography. The architecture studio worked with MNLA to design the green space, which will be home to 100 species of trees and plants. The project is meant to foster vibrant art, education, and community space, creating a distinct performance venue. At the same time, it also serves as a re resilience mecha mechanism against climate change, shielding the shoreline from storms, so they say. And this is 
you remember when we saw the project in Shanghai, that hill-like uh, housing project, this is something else, but he uses almost uh, identical structures made of very heavy, massive uh, concrete in order to support the poor plants that have been removed from the earth from which they grew. And to me, this is not ecology. Sorry, Mr. Heatherwick, I don't think you ask the right questions. Yes, it might look a little bit interesting, but in essence, it's the same deadly uh, assault on, 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 on earth, on nature, that man keeps doing. Uh, as the French saying goes, la même Jeannette, autrement coiffe. The same Jeannette, but with a different coiffure. It's exactly the same thing. The arrogance of man against nature. Concrete against the plant. Yes, nicely designed. Yes, smooth. Yes, great technology. But in essence, it shows nothing else but the arrogance of man. Now, we, we polluted the, the earth. Now we move on the water because, of course, you know, we don't have any longer nature on land. So we have to, 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 we have to remove it from there. Sorry about this. It makes me crazy, this, 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 uh, this telephone. And I don't know how to turn it off. I'm a primitive in this respect. And I, sorry, I have to go with it somewhere in a different room. Not that I have a lot of rooms, but uh, happy, hopefully it will not ring again. Sorry about this uh, little drama here. So coming back to this, uh, I think that at bottom, this is, a, this is a vicious project. And it's more vicious than some of the others because it mimics, again, it mimics some kind of uh, organic, uh, uh, so-called natural, uh, uh, affectionate uh, uh, relationship with the water and with the sky and with the plants and so on. It's simply not true. I mean, this wa the water itself is raped by these concrete uh, things. And nature, what can we say? You know, I wouldn't like to be that bush or tree or grass or plant or whatever planting there forever on top of a concrete pedestal. No, I wouldn't like that. Yes, the effort is sublime. I mean, look at it, you know, a lot of know-how, a lot of computers, a lot of everything, a lot of money. Look at the poor tree, you know. I mean, really, this Mr. Heatherwick is not aware of what he's doing. Look at the sadness of the tree. Yes, it's not yet green, but when it's green, it's even more sad standing on top of, of a concrete uh, pillar, you know. Ah, the blindness of the present. Can you imagine the costs involved? I mean, you could have built a, you know, a town for uh, people in need uh, with the money spent here, I would say frivolously. But what can we do? It attracts people because it's uh, spectacular, so to speak. It's scandalous. And uh, yeah, we, are, uh, we love shows, don't we? You know, this is architectural soap opera, in my opinion. Uh, yes, it has talent. Yes, it has skill. But, but what are they, they used for? This is my, my question. To, to pollute even, fu even further what is already polluted, because this is what is happening. You know, instead of having great affection for a nature which is assaulted from all sides by the human beings, we assault it even further. Uh, it's just incredible to me, you know. It's impossible for me to remain optimistic when I see such images. The proliferation of man, the proliferation, and again, I love concrete. But here is, 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 is almost perverse, you know, to go with these massive things on water. We, and obviously they, they don't float. So they, you know, can you imagine creating the foundations for them because they don't float? Uh, I don't know. 
the developers, the so-called developers, the, the beneficiaries, the clients are vicious. And I would say the architect as well. I, I, I don't think they are enlightened beings. Sorry, Mr. Heatherwick, I, I created this presentation to say happy birthday to you, but I'm critical of you uh, in some respects. And this is one of them. This is not love for nature. This is hatred for nature. That's how I call it. But anyway, we move forward. The poor workers don't have any, they, sh they are not responsible for this, of course. This melodrama on water, in water, from water. And now this is a project for Tokyo, which has some qualities. Again, we are dealing with a, with a talented, a skillful designer and architect. But the attitude is the same one. We certainly we are not going to give up to our beloved glass, the bigger the better. We are not going to give up on our luxuries, no. But now, because yes, uh, we realize that we need green, we climb the, our uh, other, other rather arrogant structure with green. And uh, in this way, we, 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 we mimic being submissive to nature, but we are not. The, 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 the spirit, so to speak, is, is identical with the one that erected these, you know, insolent, insolent towers. Uh, so Thomas Hederwick, he says, it's been very exciting working on this project uh, in, uh, in Japan, and much of our effort has been focused on designing the public spaces that everyone will experience when they spend time in this new area. era. Area, As many new developments around the world can be harsh and sterile, we wondered if we could provide a more human-centered alternative by integ integrating surprisingly intense quantities of planting and greenery. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Heatherick, you are not very uh, rigorous here in terms of uh, what you say. On one hand, you say a more human-centered alternative, and then you mention planting and greenery. Well, I don't understand. If your concern is, is with planting and greenery, then certainly the human is not in a central position, but the planting and the greenery, meaning nature. But, but you know, he actually told the truth. His concern is still with a human-centered so-called alternative. So you can eliminate that word. It's about mimicking mimicking that we are finally bowing our heads in front of nature and stepping down from our pedestals. No, the human is still centered, very much so. And now we cover that center with, uh, with uh, green, with greenery. But there is something else here too, is the ruin aspect. Because we, at the first sight, if you are not very careful, you almost have a feeling that this is a building that is either collapsed or collapsing or, uh, you know, is something wrong with it. Is, it, it is ruined. And in this sense, he, he did whisper some kind of a truth that nature is assaulting us because, you know, whatever uh, Winnie Mas might have said, uh, we cannot uh, 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 outsmart nature. <laughs> It's impossible. It's enough not to clean up a room for a while and then the little insects show up, the bugs. So it's impossible. We cannot outsmart nature. In no way. It's very, very childish to say something like this. Now, what, what uh, Thomas Heatherwick did, he, of course, he is protesting against this. Uh, and he gives the impression that, uh, yes, somehow nature is... Uh, is uh, is, is coming back, but uh, in essence, is still the human being that is centered, as he himself said, and is mimicking, it is only mimicking being ruined uh, by nature. That's how I read it. But it's still interesting. It's interesting, but when you look at these massive, probably concrete things, uh, you know, this Arcadia here is actually a uh, false. Uh, false reality. It's still the greed, but it's a greed which is distorted. The distortions of the greed, the distortions of the enlightened man or the enlightenment. Um, 
in essence, as I said, is la même Jeannette autrement coiffée, the same Jeannette with a different coiffure. These are indeed very simplistically proclaiming uh, something that this is proclaiming too, but with a mask, I would say. Look at this. And look at this massive thing in order to, 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 you know, to support the most fragile of beings, you know, because they are very fragile. So uh, I don't know. I, I consider it a perversion and uh, a problematic. Because what we see underneath the fragile nature is still the, the, the arrogance of man, you know, big supermarkets, big, big shops, uh, luxury shops, uh, big uh, designers, uh, big names, big everything, many shoes, many bags, many everything, you know, still consume, consume, consume. And we still talk about crisis and sustainability and ecology and so on. This is not ecological, it's not sustainable, it's not truly loving nature, it's mimicking loving nature. If you truly love nature, you left these bushes and trees and grass and plants where they belong, on the earth. Sorry for my uh, conformism. Anyway, and now if you want, I, I can uh, talk about his partner uh, a little bit because, uh, of course, uh, this man just uh, from today to tomorrow, he builds uh, uh, probably a building a day or something. Um, but I think it's interesting to, to, to present both at the same time because uh, uh, um, because they, I don't know, in a way they are both, uh, they are a little bit similar, these two architects. I don't know why this thing showed up here, but uh, anyway, uh, strange. Something happened to, okay, it went away, thank God. Big, I mean, even the name itself, of course it's his name, you know, Bjarke Inge's group, but he enjoys bigness, why? because he is the, the professional son of another man who loves bigness or loved bigness, although he loves now the bigness of the villages or rural life, that is Rem Kolhas, you know, with his Office of Metropolitan Architecture and uh, his famous book about uh, which culminates into bigness. These are the knights of bigness. And it just happens that the initials of his name go well with a G, you know, uh, I would have avoided it actually, because that that is so convenient, but so also bothering. The fact that uh, Bjarke Ingels became a group, meaning big. Okay, uh, Kenneth Frampton wrote me an email uh, a while ago, recommending me a book and I could send you the title. I, uh, I, it's called, I think it's called Small is Beautiful. But of course, Bjarke Ingels would not have enjoyed smallness. He is about bigness. Now, let's see a few quotes by him. For me, architecture is the means, not the end. It's a means of making different life forms possible. This I actually like and I agree with. It's indeed, it is a means. It's not the an end in itself. And it is a means of, through which we make proposals, so to speak, for different life forms. I agree with him here. Then he says, architecture is about trying to make the world a little more like our dreams. With this, I like as I, I, I agree as, as, as well. If we could uh, uh, provoke a, a, small, a small betterment of life through our architectural gestures, uh, we could say that we are doing the right thing. I agree with what he says here. Architects dislike building their own homes because they have no client to blame by themselves. <laughs> a humorous way of, of putting it. I don't know if that's the reason. I don't know. I, I'm not very sure. Some say that great architects build first for their mothers. Um, could it be because they, they like to blame their mothers for in case they fail? I'm just a, improvising a question now. Dan, that's a false statement because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed doing my own uh, bungalow. Well, maybe you are <laughs> not the rule. No, he was talking about architects in general, and it's it's true that some architects have a difficult, but it's not true just of architects. Even a shoemaker, 
it's yeah. known that the shoemaker doesn't make shoes for himself. Um, anyway, uh, in the big in picture, fact, uh, yeah, so, sorry. In please. fact, it's a challenge uh, because you want to do something which is better than all your other work. That's that's my feeling. Yeah. Yeah, but with that comes also the fear of failing. I am not. I don't know. Maybe he's right. Maybe not so right. But uh, anyway, in the big picture, architecture is the art and science of making sure that our cities and buildings fit with the way we want to live our lives. I don't know. I mean, this is a little bit predictable and simplistic, but architects have to become designers of ecosystems. Mm, not just designers of beautiful facades or beautiful sculptures, but systems of economy and ecology, where we channel the flow not only of people, but also the flow of resources through our cities and buildings. I don't know. It sounds yeah. very righteous, but... They, they look as if they are written for magazines, as well, quotes? They, they probably are, of course. It's propaganda. Uh, the notion that sustainability needs to sacrifice quality of life is a flawed one. I don't know if you were here yesterday when I asked Mahadev, what about achieving some kind of a sustainability where we become less uh, demanding? And I, you know, I, I was making a joke. I said, uh, you know, become masochistic. In other words, to accept a certain level of suffering, which in, in the words of uh, Bjarke Ingels would mean to sacrifice so-called the quality of life. But since we have uh, Vatsal with us here, who is from Ahmedabad, and maybe he knows something about the, the, the yogi. The yogis, would you say that they sacrifice the quality of life without gaining something actually superior? Because in the process of so-called sacrificing the, the so-called quality of life, you could actually achieve enlightenment. You could achieve a, awareness, spiritual enlightenment. So, you know, someone who says that the sustainability doesn't need to sacrifice the quality of life, what does he mean by the quality of life? To watch TV on the, on the sofa? To, I don't know, drink a delicious orange while watching a crime story on TV? What, what, what is a quality life, actually? Dan, uh, they, they turn up in these lectures uh, in the most expensive car possible, and then they talk about sustainability. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, some do not come by car, but it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not just about that. It's, a, it's about this idea. Didn't I say in, in, in relationship with Heatherwick that this is still a human-centered vision of the world, you know, where we don't want to give up anything. You know, we want to have it all. I mean, all. This, he's a hedonist, he even uh, said it. It's a design challenge, a challenge to build something that transforms the idea of sustainability into something that will increase the quality of life for all those around it. Again, what do we mean by the quality of life? And then we can talk about what kind of people is he addressing with his buildings? Because with the exception of one single building, everything else he builds, he builds for millionaires. I mean, you know, easy to talk about increasing the quality of life for someone, for a yuppie in Miami or New York who has plenty of money, you know, millions to buy a penthouse or an apartment. Or I don't know. I don't know on what floor with a with a balcony as big as a stadium. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, yes, is more. Here, I don't agree with him. Yes, it's good to be optimistic. Yes, it's good to be proactive. But I think there is a problem. Somebody is playing with an iPhone. I see, I see, uh, is 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 tracing some yellow lines on the on the screen, and those lines will remain will remain unless someone. I mean, maybe someone who doesn't like Bjarke Ingels. Uh, someone who is doing that with the iPhone, please. Because now the whole screen is covered with them and they will not go away. They will remain until the end of the presentation. You see them. They are there, but uh, on why do you don't see them very well? Anyway, for me, architecture is the means, not the end. Uh, we already saw this. Uh, sustainability is unappealing, unappealing if it's always portrayed as something negative, a form of moral self-denial. This man has a problem with this. Obviously, this man wouldn't appreciate very much uh, 
you know, an austere artist or poet or a, a yogi. No. An ethical dilemma, a moral sacrifice, a political dilemma or a philanthropic donation. We are changing the, the angle and saying that sustainable cities can be a way of improving our quality of life. Again, what do you mean by quality of life? Material life? Spiritual life? Cultural life? Which kind of life? Because sometimes, you know, what we call material life is in, uh, in some kind of a contradiction with a spiritual life. It's known that, I mean, many people thought that you achieve spirituality sometimes even through suffering, much more than through happiness, actually. Anyway, I all, you see now the signs, uh, they, they will remain here forever, and I don't know who did it and why. Maybe it was just an accident. I mean, maybe it's an interesting accident. I will continue. I almost never listen to the radio. Interesting, you know. I mean, who said that? I mean, after all, who's, who listens to the radio these days? This is a funny statement. I don't have to come up with the best idea. It is my job to make sure that it is always the best idea that wins. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. And again, what does he mean by best? Sustainability can be, can be like some sort of a moral sacrifice. I, I read this before. It has to be a design challenge and some drawings by him. Um, yeah, He's, uh, he drills, you know, quickly and efficiently, but uh, I don't know, his drawings don't convince me very much. I mean, they are simplistic, and I wouldn't say they are the most sensitive drawings in the world. Uh, the, the drawings of Tom Maine, by comparison, are by far much more lyrical and uh, poetical. Uh, these are, you know, just like his architecture, it's very... Uh, I don't know how to put it, you know, in a way simplistic, efficient. Um, he is interesting, you know, as Rem Kolha said, he's a phenomenon. He represents a new kind of architect. I don't know exactly what <clears throat> Rem Kolha has meant by that, but uh, <clears throat> here we see the building that you know <clears throat> in uh, New York City and you are going to, we are going to see it. Um, here he's like a child drawing on the floor, and I like this, I like the image, but I prefer his compatriot, John Woodson, <clears throat> playing, <clears throat> playing with some <clears throat> cubes or structures on the floor without a camera above and without, I mean, here you probably, uh, probably around him there are 100 people watching him, and it's, it's a lot of showmanship here, you know, uh, the mechanism of publicity is highly, highly uh, used. So he has a blue architect Bjarke Ingels has a blueprint to rescue humanity. My God, my God, a very modest uh, statement indeed. Can you imagine? Not even God has a blueprint to rescue humanity, but Bjarke Ingels has it. Okay, and here it is. It's so simple, you know. Product of a pl uh, planet policy and uh, proaction. Master planet. It's so simple, no? Uh, five uh, diagrams, and the world is saved. Who said that the life, uh, the, the life on Earth is in trouble? No, no. It's very, very simple. Everything uh, in in his conception, uh, everything is so very simple. Uh, what is amazing is actually that he he, he achieves uh, uh, um, convincing other people of, of this simplicity. Hello, Mr. Uh, Ingels. Uh, do you enjoy yourself there with the uh, with uh, with uh, photographers uh, doing their job? You probably do. Anyway, his drawings in any other age would have been considered simplistic, insensitive, cartoon-like, and and so on. These are not. If you go to drawing sketches by Bernini or even Alvaralto or Luis Kahn or Carlo, I'm not even mentioning Carlo Scarpa different kind of creators, different kind of architects, different kind of people. Here we have a man who draws, uh, he has the virtuosity, yes, but the drawings are very banal. I mean, look at them. They are cartoon-like all. Yes, he has a clear thinking, so to speak, but I would say too clear, because I think life is not just about yes. Yes is more, you know, uh, not always yes is more. 
Uh, for example, uh, if you said yes to the bo uh, bombing, bomb bombing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, would that have meant more, uh, Mr. Ingels? And uh, too many injustices of the world, too hunger, too... If we say yes to, to them, is it more, Mr. Ingels? So aren't you actually superficial, Mr. Ingels? Yes, you are. And this explains, in a way, the incredible... Uh, efficiency that you have and the, the ability to, to, to build so much so quickly, exactly because of lack of depth. That's why. Look at this. All his works are done based on a simple uh, diagram, A plus B equals C. As if it is, as if, as, is, as if in life, it's as simple. What is strange, this man comes from the same country with Hamlet. Hamlet, the, the prince of, of doubting. This man knows no doubting. You know, this plus this equals this. Who said that life is difficult or architecture is difficult? No. Uh, with, with these such diagrams, he, he seduces, he impresses, he, uh, he obtains great commissions. And because clients, uh, so-called clients, are not uh, really off, offsprings of Hamlet themselves. You see. Tirana grid plus Mecca orientation equals new mosque of Tirana. So very simple now, except that uh, life is much more complex, I would say, if I'm allowed to express what I think. But, but it works. It works. The cartoons work. You know, Orcus, a great uh, Danish uh, uh, town, city. Uh, it, it's, it's fine, this building to an extent, but it's it's still based on a, on a, a conceptualization, on a, on, a, on a simplistic manipulation of so-called concepts. Yes, it's fine. It's, uh, it has a level, level of uh, reason here. Uh, it's, uh, it has diagonal, so that creates uh, uh, the, exceptionals, the exceptionalism of diagonals uh, adds to the movement of the structure. Uh, but in my opinion, it, it's, it's, it's not actually complex. It's, it's, sim it's simplistic, but in a different way simplistic than, let's say, these buildings here. That's, that's about it. Of course, I prefer somehow this, but not always to these. It depends. Uh, he likes, he, he kind of knows. He knows that twisting is working for our time. He's truly the right man at the right time in the right place. He knows twisting is good. He knows spirals are good. He, he, he's incredibly anchored in the present. And in, in, in some of his works, he expresses our time uh, very well, but in a, somehow in, a, in, in, in an alarming way for me. Uh, and, you know, who said you, you cannot have a romance, you know, on the, on the other side of the water and contemplate the, you know, the building which appears to be different from all the other buildings, but it's not actually so very different. Because besides the fact that this is this, you know, the sloping, uh, uh, you know, this diagonal here, the apartments here, the basic apartments are not very different from these or these or these. Anyway. Uh, why not? And if you if you study the morphology of his buildings, in essence, it's about the same thing. We have a slab, we have a, a lot of glass, and uh, you know the structure in a certain way is through his manipulation of so-called concepts uh, provides an easy way to towards um, um, you know uh, achieving uh, sometimes uh, you know exciting forms, but only to an extent, because the Lego mentality is still at place, uh, at work there. He was formed as a child, but, but besides that, because many people play with Lego, and it's nice Lego, I play with Lego too, but his architecture doesn't evolve too much from the Lego mentality. The watch flower, this is a, was created as a three-dimensional promenade that floats in the space above the harbor edge and the water of Dock 7 in Orcus Har Harbor, a 155 meter long slope sloping promenade meanders like a mountain path along a cliff 
site peaking at the height of 7.5 meters designed with handicap accessibility yeah he is very interested in that of course uh, had clearance and statics in mind the promenade takes shape as a flower gradually growing from the concrete harbor edge towards the sky well is it really how a flower is i mean <laughs> you know in my opinion it's too heavy for a flower much too heavy it's showmanship i like the model though and i like the man who created the model and you are going to see him but otherwise it's just uh, another showmanship uh, that uh, is rather empty in my opinion for me for me it is rather empty uh, and uh, you know to to talk about a flower in relation with what we see is to insult the flower in my opinion because the fragility the subtle uh, uh, difference of a flower is 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 not even mimicked here you know so what is flower like this shape that in plan looks now has nothing to do with a flower but i like the model and i like the man who did the model and you see him there uh, you know uh, uh, transporting the the model to somewhere uh, here he is working on the on the on, on the model and scum what is scum yeah this is an interesting uh, uh, structure a little bit burlesque, but uh, why not? It's a temporary inflated structure. Uh, I don't know. It, why not? Arata Isozaki did one too, not quite like this. And there are other architects who love to uh, inflate uh, things uh, to, you know, sufficiently large uh, dimensions. So, uh, He did something like this too. It's a lesser known work by him or them uh, for parties, of course. He loves parties. He's a hedonist. He is not uh, shy about it. He loves uh, the good life, although maybe deep down he is not so uh, joyous as he claims he is. Uh, completes a pair of twisting towers in Miami and uh, the shameless Kengo Kuma. Sorry to talk about uh, using such harsh words was uh, Ken Gokuma, but Ken Gokuma not only that inspired himself copiously, it seems, from a, a project by Zaha Hadid for the National Stadium of Japan, but also he has two towers almost identical with what, uh, or very similar to what uh, uh, Bjarke Ingels did here. These towers are also good in the sense they have the twisting, they create a, create a variety, a movement, a dynamics, the structure is done very well. You see here, and I mean, these slabs is clean architecture. Now he's without doubt um, clever. This is a clever architecture. You know, just through this twisting, he creates all of a sudden a certain ex exceptionalism for the buildings. And uh, this is important. But when you think about uh, the, the, the social mechanisms and the financial mechanisms behind this, uh, uh, this, um, you know, rather facile architecture, uh, you begin to wonder a little bit. But it's still, compared to many other buildings, uh, it offers something interesting. Let's use the word interesting. And I, I admire the structure. It's so ingeniously and simply done. Uh, too bad these apartments are truly for those who... <laughs> Uh, can uh, afford uh, some twisting without uh, breaking down. Hello. Now, who said architects are usually unhappy people? No, no, not Bjarke Ingels. <laughs> Actually, I feel like punching him in his, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to call it, not punching, you know, picking up a little bit of his uh, cheeks. He, he's probably a, a sympathic, uh, sympathic man, you know, uh, like uh, this Danish boy who, <laughs> Who did it? He did it. That's the truth. He did it. <laughs> Bravo to him. Uh, anyway, concrete, concrete, concrete. Uh, is he there? No, he's a happy couple. I mean, look at that balcony. You know, it's, I don't know, six meters, eight meters wide, six meters wide. It's huge and long. I don't know, 100 meters. I exaggerated, but it's, 
Anyway, this is not for mortals. And there is the architect. You can recognize his uh, less than slender silhouette on the right side. Um, I mean, he's a married man. I, I wonder what his wife says about all his travels. I mean, he goes everywhere. You know, he, he you know, he, he lives on a, on a boat, uh, in, uh, on water, actually, uh, on, a, on a boat, a ship. He bought a ship and that's his home. That's interesting, too. But look at this. I mean, lux calme volupte, as I said. Ah, marble, uh, you know, spacious uh, rooms. Uh, everything is so, uh, <laughs> so unaffordable, actually. Uh, the pool is surrounded by stone with a fossilized coral relief. This I like. I love the coral relief. And look at this. It's magnificent. It really is. I mean, if we could inspire ourselves from this coral relief, I think we could gain something. Uh, and the columns that support the structure. He had a very good engineer, an Italian engineer. I forgot his name. And it shows. It helps to have a very good engineer. The bar is the bar, gray. And here is, on the left, the man who makes the money. Even more after he built the twisted structures. And on the right, the man at the drafting board with his uh, shoulders a little bit lower because of drafting on the drafting board. Of course, I am a little bit uh, joking. Uh, anyway, the client on the left, the client, uh, the, 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 um, the serviceman, the architect on the right. Black for the client, white for the provider of services. The Twist Bridge Museum uh, in, in Norway is, uh, is a building I like. But again, the building museum on the left, the, the, the schemata, the, the, you know, the, the ideogram, the infrastructure, the bridge, the art and sculpture, all combined, you get this. There is no other way you can get anything else. Can you believe it? I mean, why this? And not why, why not something else? Uh, we propose a hybrid of architecture, infrastructure, and sculpture. I think it's a good idea. And uh, this twisting is kind of exactly in the middle of the road is important because uh, here uh, the museum uh, uh, turns, you see, from uh, horizontality into verticality is this twisting. I, I think it's a very ingenious building, although it irritates some people. It was built impeccably, I mean, truly impeccably. And uh, in a way, it makes sense because when you cross a river exactly in the middle of the bridge, something happens in the sense that it is from there approximately. It's not exactly in the middle, but uh, almost. It is there where you move from, you know, you, you turn your back on, on the side you left and you move towards the side that is awaiting you, so to speak. It is still uh, hands off. Here is the architect uh, explaining to the politicians or the visitors how things are, uh, emphatically enough so they would uh, invest further into his firm. And he's probably very, very good at this. And his posture does show it. Uh, and um, he's, of course, in Norway now, where he's, uh, he's Danish. Um, and the interior is interesting too because twistings add that accidental movement that is, uh, uh, you know, saying yes to life since he loves yes so much. Homes for all uh, residents. This is the one I like not so much because necessarily, even if its architecture is not unpleasant, but the fact that he worked for those less privileged. Homes for all. In other words, he built a residence that uh, was not for, as opposed to the twisted towers in Miami, here he worked for regular people, so to speak. And I like this. Therefore, this I applaud him. And I, I, I would shake his hand without hesitations. You know, the interior is still decent and nice, and, uh, but for, uh, for humans, not for uh, immortals. That is for mortals, not immortals. Um, now, of course, the standards of Denmark are different from the stars of standards of other countries because they have a high standard of living. So, you know, someone 
less privileged in Denmark uh, live still a comfortable life compared to many people on this earth. But you see here there are graffitis too. Uh, anyway, we are moving forward. Uh, I'm glad he did such a project as well. There is a system here and he loves systems, but he also loves to betray them a little bit through twisting and other, 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 other schemes. <laughs> Who said architecture is difficult? You see, it's very simple. You get this, uh, you know, uh, box, uh, and then you know you just move a little bit the the fragments, the parts, and you get this very very simple uh, Taiwan. Now this one was realized just a fragment. This 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 part, as far as I know, until now, he um, was. In my opinion, they are a little bit aggressive. They are not really mountain like. They are still, you know, they have the authority of men. They are, they are, they are artificial uh, and artificial hills or mountain like uh, structures, a little bit almost gothic, even a little bit uh, threatening, I would say. But only that part was built that you saw. Um, Yes, he get he gets along with uh, I mean he, he, uh, how how is the saying I forgot uh, gets along with murder or no no gets along uh, is a different expression. Sorry for my poor level of English, uh, but you understand. It was not built, but it might be built. Who knows? The whole of it. Taiwan. Uh, the sun orientation. I'm glad that he takes into account the sun movement. That's good. Uh, so you see, we saw with Heather Week, we see with Ingels, we see with others, the mountain is back. <laughs> we need a mountain, badly. Uh, mimicked or real, but we need mountains. Clear, it's clear. So uh, just this fragment was built for now. Now, this is a celebrated work because uh, it is advertised as being truly sustainable and so on. And he, because he loves diagonals, of course, he created this uh, ski uh, sloping uh, uh, plane for uh, uh, skiing. And I don't know exactly how, how this works, but uh, uh, I don't know what to say. I, I still think it celebrates the centrality of the human being uh, too much. He, although it says that it is highly sustainable and so on, uh, to me, it's still, it's still uh, an expression of the kingdom of man. Man, the measure of all things. Having fun, in a way, on this earth. Why not? I mean, look at those vapors as those clouds emerging from the machinery towards the sky, you know, uh, are they uh, so clean? Maybe they are. I mean, they look whitish, it's true, but I don't know. Someone is jumping there just in exasperation or uh, out of joy. It's hard to know. The plan is kind of interesting, a little bit neurotical. It is hedonistic, but uh, with a, a little bit neurotical, I would say. But the, the, the children, well, not just the children, like it. Um, since, the, since they have no mountains, why not uh, climb on this thing? Now, the, the, so the tallest climbing wall was, was added to this uh, structure by Bjarke Ingels. You see it here. Of course, what does the human being, uh, uh, being tired of being on a pedestal of the world for too long, wants to jump a little bit to so-called have uh, the thrill of adventure. So then it climbs on walls, on the ceiling or whatever, you know, to have a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, excitement. Otherwise life could become very unbearable after so much happiness. And uh, it just happened that this X here is just, uh, you know, crossing out this, uh, uh, this part of his building. 
the, the adventure, the vertical adventure park. It's not really a park, but we see here, uh, um, you know, a uh, uh, human being uh, a little bit tired of uh, sitting down for too long and trying, attempting to go all the way up. This is an interesting building, the Vancouver House in Canada. Um, uh, you know, he said, the, think of Vancouver House as a giant curtain at the moment of being pulled back to reveal the world to Vancouver and Vancouver to the world. I think he expressed very, very, very clearly uh, this so-called total work of art. Uh, yes, in a way, you could say that the building is just enlarging the space towards uh, advancing towards the city or the other way. It's, it's, it's some kind of a uh, um, uh, kind uh, curtain that does not separate brutally the city from what is outside of itself. But in essence, it's still about that twisting that he likes so much because he is tired himself of the boredom of the regular prisms. So, and he, cre he wants to create, I imagine, this effect of uh, his mimicking instability. So he brings instability into stability. And I think that is, I would say, a legitimate uh, uh, strategy. He does it in this way, other people do it in, in some other way. But I, I think it's always good to try to uh, unite stability with instability. master plan for this, uh, this island, these islands in Malaysia. So biodiversity, we are approaching the end, please, if you are still here, uh, um, bear with me for a few more minutes. This is the end of the presentation. Uh, biodiversity will have an integrated system of localized water resources, renewable energy and waste management tied all together in a human made ecosystem. Rather than design a city for cars, we design biodiversity for waterways, rail, and different kinds of personal mobility, forming a multimodal environment of movement. Of course, why would we renounce to movement? The resultant urban landscape will be a celebration, but please know the, these proposals were made before the pandemic, be a celebration of Penang's position as a truly global crossroads of the world, economically, ecologically, and socially. Yes is more. And uh, now this is a utopian uh, project of um, a certain magnitude. And uh, again, who said that life is difficult or it has problems or suffering? No, here is, uh, you know, the, the joy of living is uh, at its maximum almost. I mean, look at this, you know, there is no rust, there are no ruins, there is no suffering, there are no beggars. No, it's everybody is enjoying life and you wonder who works. You know, who works and where? <laughs> anyway, who cares? The important thing is that, the, that yes is more. And since yes is more, there, there can only be joy on earth. Look at this thing here. You know, yes, this is a little bit abrupt, but who cares? You know, there are brakes now. This vehicle has brakes. Uh, everything will work fine with with a mentality that yes is more um, indonesia malaysia sorry and but what do we see here man the invader keeps going keeps invading the more the better climbing the hills climbing everything, leveling mountains and hills, and then erecting buildings mountain-like, is the assault of man, of the human being on Earth. The other things don't matter too much. The insects, the plants, the stones, the animals, not really. This is about man. The man, the form giver, the man who is the shepherd of existence, the man who says, yes, is more. And more it becomes, as you can see. We don't yet see the international airport, but it should be here somewhere, although the pandemic complicates matters. Um, 
Yeah. No one is masked here because this project was done before the pandemic, but uh, I wonder, you know, what do you do now when you begin to be afraid of even being in close proximity to someone? You know? Anyway, maybe things will get back to normal, as, as they say. Maybe. Hopefully. Although a French writer, a famous writer now in France, I forgot his name, he said that, uh, you know, most people think that the pandemic will change human life, will change people, but he said, I'm skeptical. I think we remain the same, maybe a little bit worse. That's what he said. But the French love to, uh, to flirt with pessimism. And this is the latest architecture and news, BRK Ingels Group designs an innovation campus hosting headquarters of the tech firm in China, of course, you know, where else? So as unveiled is designed for AI City, the future home for Terminus Group, a smart service provider, imagined as the new center of innovation for China. The project will be dedicated to artificial intelligence, robotics, networking, and big data. Big, the bigger, the better located in this place in China, known as the mountain city. Again, the mountain is coming back. The project is set within the, I can read, industrial development zone. The high tech campus uh, will house the headquarters. Everything is about headquarters and so on. The first phase and so on conceived as two plots of, that mimic each other's opposites. In fact, Big's proposal draws inspiration from the surrounding landscape, of course. And uh, yeah, convenient architecture. Uh, 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 there is beauty. There is, there is. I, I, I have to say it. But everything is so clean and you know civilized and uh, I don't know harmonious. Yeah, I don't know what to say. There is no garbage. No, everything is fine. You know. Uh, and then you have convexity and concavity and the roofs are, are, are making uh, uh, the, mount the mountain that was mentioned. Thanks to the roofs, the architecture is not apparently banal. Um, and uh, everyone is elegant and satisfied and, and, and uh, happy with herself or himself. Uh, you can almost get sick of so much happiness and harmony. Sorry for my cynicism. Time to transform. <laughs> Are we really transforming so much? The Archangels, mountain like, valley like. The mountain plus the valley equals his scheme. Very, very simple. Park plus building. In nature and artificial intelligence. And that's it. Very, very simple. Grid and artificial intelligence. Arrows moving outwards and outwards and moving inwards, uh, upwards and downwards. Uh, everything is, is just conceptually so very clear almost alarming, uh, alarmingly clear. Big Sun conventional Uppsala power plant designed to host summer festivals. The city of Uppsala, I think this is the last project, uh, home of Scandinavia's oldest university and landmark Uppsala Cathedral. The plant proposal's biggest challenge was to respect the city's historic site, considering the project's proposed seasonal use envision a dual use power plant that transcends the public perception. In the summer months, the crystalline proposal was designed to transform into a venue for festivals during the peak of tourism. Well, not too much tourism any longer, but uh, again, what can you do? The pandemic did, did provoke some changes. In essence, it's not so complicated. He covered uh, that functional structure with something more uh, pleasing and then of course people sit in the grass and enjoy themselves as if the world is just that you know playing in the grass with chaise and, and so on and again who is working you know who is working 
Mr. Ingalls. <laughs> Uh, an inviolable life, really. Then, isn't this a geodesic dome or a variation of that? It probably is. Uh, linear layout, uh, compacted layout, arrows, concepts, dome more with less. <laughs> of course, more with less, optimized. Everything is optimized and squeezed dome, compacted layout. Uh, That's we, Buck, Buckminster Fuller's design, the one, the slide behind. Well, I think he 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 proposed something like this. Oh. He was not the only one. Yes, he did. You are right. Uh, okay, but for Ingels, very thing is very simple, really. The Google had what I hope I because I'm beginning to be tired of of the of the bigness of the big office work. Google headquarters by Big and Thomas. In fact, we end with the beginning. Thomas Heatherwick. Here they are, the two of them, the heroes, the immortals. And this is the project during construction. It's huge. I mean, look at the cars of the uh, minuscule little insects. It's huge. But we are talking about uh, the gods on Mount Olympus, no? With Google. And NASA collaborate to design a 3D printed buildings for the moon. Uh, sure. Uh, all these architects plan to go to the moon called Project Olympus. It aims to develop a way to create a 3D printed infrastructure for living on the moon using materials found on its surface. Great. Would you go there, Mr. Um, Ingels? Because I wouldn't. I really, I'm too, too conventional to go there. You can't even ride a bicycle in shorts on the moon or Mars. You can't. Uh, maybe you'll have other interesting experiences, but not that one. Anyway, uh, I'm not against utopia at all, but why don't we create some kind of a better life here on Earth? Although he's trying that too. Uh, um, yeah, maybe we should say no to going to the Mars and to the Moon. Even if, can you imagine yourself being, I mean, forget the mask. Now, we only put a mask about the, about the mouth and the nose. But look here. Can you imagine living like this? I can't. I don't understand. These people are mad. Why would they want to live like this? It's beyond me. I couldn't live like this. I just couldn't. That's it. Thank you very much. If you are still here, a few of you. Oh, 11 people. My God, my God. <laughs> 